I've done some dumb things. I'll do dumb things again. Old enough to be a United States senator, 30 being the minimum age prescribed by the Constitution. Biden, a liberal Democrat, pulled one of the big upsets of the election by unseating a 63-year-old Republican, Caleb Boggs. In Washington today, he was having trouble convincing some people he really is a senator and having some doubts about the Senate seniority system while hoping older members won't hold his age against him. I expect these fellows are going to... Uh... Uh, eventually uh, judge me on my merit, not on my age, and uh, I have to establish that merit, assuming there is any there. Uh, and it's not going to make any difference my saying this, but it's not because I'm 30 and coming in. I, I think that the seniority system uh, has many more drawbacks and it has merits. Where I'm not going to lead any move to change that in my formative years in the Senate, but were there to be such a vote to come up, I clearly would vote to eliminate the seniority system. Uh, the indications are that you may be 100th in seniority, the last man on the totem pole <laughs> in the Senate. Does that bother you? Well, no, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, I think it's sort of amusing uh, um, that uh, I probably have the least seniority of anyone ever to enter this august body. What disturbs me more than the policy that you call a policy is the rationale for the policy. The rationale for the policy. You set out four principles that you, that you adhere to, and then you, and, and I will go over them in a moment. Then you say on page 14, we must not become part of South Africa's problem. We must remain part of their solution. We must not aim to impose ourselves, our solutions, our favorites in South Africa. Damn it, we have favorites in South Africa. The favorites in South Africa are the people who are being repressed by that ugly white regime. We have favorites. Our loyalty is not to South Africa, it's to South Africans. And the South Africans are majority black, and they are being excoriated. It is not to some stupid puppet government over there. It is not to the Afrikaners regime. We have no loyalty to them. We have no loyalty to South Africa, to South Africans. And the fact of the matter is we, I mean, I listen to this rationale first of all. It is the leaders of South Africa and their people, black and white, who have the majority responsibility. They must rise to it. Well, they are rising to it. They're rising to it with the only thing left available to them with that repulsive, repugnant regime of Afrikaners there. And it's the only way they have. They've tried everything for the last 20 years. They begged, they borrowed, they crawled, and now they're taking up arms. The second thing, progress toward peace requires a timetable. Timetable, elimination of a part. What's our timetable? What are we saying to that repugnant regime? Are we saying you've got 20 days, 20 months, 20 years? We ask them to put up a timetable. What's our timetable? These people are being crushed. And we're sitting here with the same kind of rhetoric, the same thing we heard. We heard, go slow. We heard, we have to take care of the problem afterwards. We heard we you can't have, impose. You, you are totally misconstruing the testimony my... that I gave. Read first. Furthermore, Senator, let me say that I hate to hear a senator of the United States calling for violence. I'm not calling That's for violence. That's what you're doing. I hate that is to exactly hear. Exactly what you're I doing. I hate to hear an administration and a Secretary of State refusing to act on a morally abhorrent point. I hate to hear this country, I'm ashamed that this country puts out a policy like this that says nothing, nothing. I mean, he never, he didn't get it, doesn't understand. I don't what's, know what's going on. What's the on. big difference? What's... The fundamental difference is you got a guy who still is stuck in the past in everything. I mean, you know, uh, what skills he had as a leader in the Cold War are irrelevant. Here's a guy saying keep 150,000 troops in Europe but don't go near Bosnia. Well, what the hell are they for? different. I just want to know what you suggest, because back then, when I was in your position, I was suggesting we bomb Belgrade. I was suggesting that we send American pilots in and blow up all the bridges on the Drina. I was suggesting we take out his oil supplies. I was suggesting very specific action. And isn't it interesting that we... I mean, there's no, you know, there's no Soviet Union. There's no threat. Um, I happen to believe we should keep troops in Europe. I think 100,000 is more than enough for pre-positioning purposes. But, I mean, he has no clue. And 
know, I thought the best one was trying to convince the American people not an economic problem. Yeah, right. Oh, that was, that was good. Rich. That, that was real good. I like that. We gotta go. So, you know, with all these surrogates here, is this what the new Clinton administration is going to look like? Oh, I'm going to be chairman of the Judiciary Committee, helping put through three or four really sound, first-rate Supreme Court justices. Pray God. Okay, thanks, man. Mr. Lowenstein, why should the federal government subsidize political campaigns and limit individual contributions? Well, if you were to set out to create a country in which you would have one man, one vote, free speech guaranteed to everybody, and then you'd have candidacies in which one side would be able to spend $22 million and the other side a half a million dollars, you'd realize that that kind of democracy was a hoax. Nobody would even argue about it. Yet those instances in our society have become frequent and the fact that they don't always occur doesn't mean that they're right when they do occur. What we're proposing tonight is that there be a way in which everybody, even if they're not born rich, have a fair chance to be elected to public office. Today in the United States, 90% of the political contributions come from 1% of the population. And what we hope we can do is to amend the law so that there will be a guarantee that people will have access to funds so they can run if they have enough support to merit it and then to put a limit on how much any one individual can give so nobody can purchase through wealth an undue share in the decision-making process. To start the uh, testimony for the evening, I call Senator Biden of Delaware. <laughs> Senator Biden, welcome to the Advocates. Thank you. Good to be here. Senator Biden, it's nice to have you here as the youngest member of the Senate, the one, therefore, who may expect the longest career there. I wonder if you'd say to us, <laughs> since it's clear that you're not corrupt and you got elected, why should people think that the system produces corrupt results when there you are? Well, I'm not sure you should assume I'm not corrupt, but I thank you for that, though. The system does produce corruption, and in, in, I think implicit in the system is corruption, when in fact, whether or not you can run for public office, and it costs a great deal of money to run for the United States Senate, even from a small state like Delaware, uh, you have to go to those people who have money, and they always want something. Well, I wonder whether you would feel that there's some virtue in forcing candidates to go out and try to raise money. I've heard people, probably people who didn't run for office, say that it's uplifting to go out and try to get money. Do you think that there's something unuplifting about putting a limit to how much you can ask one man to give you? I think it's the most degrading experience in the world to have to go out and ask for money because you know that unless you accidentally agree with the position taken by the person or group that has the money, that you run the risk of deciding whether or not you're going to prostitute yourself to give the answer you know they want to hear in order to get funded to run for that office. And uh, it's coincidental in many instances uh, when in fact you happen to agree with where they are. And you run the risk, by the way, of rationalizing, of saying, well, if I compromise on this one, give him one, I get 90% of what I want, and I don't have to give in too much. So you feel it's, it's a difficult temptation, not only for the candidate, not only for the people who give the money, but for the people trying to raise it. Well, you know, we're, we were told that we politicians, as the young kids say, rip off the American public. I think the American public, in a way, rips off we politicians by forcing us to run the way they do. To raise $300,000 $300, is no mean feat. And unless you happen to be some sort of anomaly, like myself, being a 29-year-old candidate and can attract some attention beyond your own state, it's very difficult to raise that money from a large group of people. Well, now, some people who agree with the problem, or our definition of the problem, turn around and say, you just had full disclosure, that would solve it. Do you think that would have a major effect on the problems you're describing? I think full disclosure is essential. We have that now, allegedly. Um, but that's not going to get to the question of how you have to raise the money and the influence of those who come forward with the money, whether they be a labor union or uh, a corporate executive. Well, if we put a limit on what individuals can give, and if we have public assistance for candidates, do you think that would work, as some have suggested, to make incumbency even more powerful, that there'd be no way then the challengers could succeed? No, I don't. But I do think you run the risk in limiting the amount that can be spent of continuing to cost some three hundred thousand dollars two hundred and seventy six thousand all right so and you raised that money by public contributions did you not that's correct and you raised that money in a race against an incumbent did you not that's correct yes and senator i'm sure that that you would agree that that your service in the senate up to this point has, has not reflected any particular concern for the larger contributors well the fortunate thing is i didn't have many larger contributors and the only reason see i went to the big guys for the money I was ready to prostitute myself. And the question is, how long is the American public going to put up with a small group of men and organizations 
determining the political process, by deciding who can run and who can't run. But, but Senator, aren't you a living example? Of, I am of an anachronism. Way I'm a 29-year-old oddball. The only reason I was able to raise the money is I was able to have a national constituency to run for office. Because I was 29, I'm like the token black or the token woman. I was the token young person. We're talking about this national, this national constituency. Uh, some of the money that that's not an announcement for all. on the big issues of budget and arms control biden's been offering innovative solutions for over a decade Thank you. Thank he has fought for fairer taxes and lowered budget deficits he's been a member of the senate budget committee since it was formed and has called for both a constitutional amendment on the budget to limit government spending and a bipartisan budget freeze this one you got with you me, me? what's your name me. you know senators are like kids Biden understands that government must play an important role in making sure that America's strength in the world is based on a sound economy at home. It seems to me, if we're going to go into the 21st century as the strongest nation in the world, there's got to be a new relationship among management, labor, and government. An encouraging increased Japanese imports at a time when you, management and labor, are redefining the relationship to build a better automobile. In fact, I think it's a tragic mistake. Unless we're able to compete worldwide and be the leader, I don't know how we can be a world power going into the 21st century. When I was here, the standard was, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And now we got candidates running for president saying, are you better off today than you were yesterday? I mean, what kind of standard is that for this country to repair to? That's the change I sense the most since I left here. But I really think that just because, you know, our heroes like John Kennedy were murdered, that they've really misjudged us just because they've been murdered doesn't mean that that hope doesn't still live buried deep in the broken hearts of tens of thousands of people who are just ready if someone asks them to step forward. I really think so. I hope you think that way. Senator Biden, you and your campaign have had a number of occasions to correct or clarify things you've said relating to race, including your remarks about Senator Obama being, quote, quote clean and articulate, your comment about Indians working at 7-Eleven, and recently to the Washington Post in which you spoke about race while describing disparities bes between schools in Washington, D.C. and Iowa. Do these gaffes or misunderstandings or however you would characterize them indicate you are uncomfortable talking about race or are people just being too sensitive? I think that uh, I have my whole career. I got involved in public policy. I got involved in politics because of the civil rights movement. It's the overwhelming core of my support in my home state. I get the overwhelming majority, over 95% of the vote of minorities in my state. I may have phrased those things wrongly, but when I talked about the Indian population, what I was making the point was they're building families. They're coming by businesses, 7-Elevens and Dunkin' Donuts and small shops, just like those Italian um, uh, uh, immigrants used to do, and they're building families. The point I was making about the inner city of Washington is the point that Barack just made. Barack made the point, he said, that minorities start off at a disadvantage. They start off at a, with, with a gap. Uh, an achievement gap that exists before they even walk into school, minorities. And so I was making the same point. It may be possible because I speak so bluntly that people misunderstand, but no one who knows me in my state, no one who I've worked with in, my, in the United States Congress has ever wondered about my commitment to civil rights and civil liberties. And if you take a look at my record as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, excuse me, of the Judiciary Committee, ranking member, chairman for 16 years, it started with the Voting Rights Act and worked its way through to, a, to a voting against constitutional amendments on busing when busing was taking place in my state. My credentials are as good as anyone who's ever run for president of the United States on civil rights. Here, 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 here. here. Senator Obama. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to. Uh, I, I just want to make the comment. I, I... Senator, what are they asking you? The that is those on the aircraft carrier. Yes. They're asking me. It ranged all the way from the pilots asking me, Senator, uh, uh, when do you think we'll be sent and if we'll be sent, and uh, to the crewmen asking me whether or not uh, I thought the Russians were going to make any further moves in Afghanistan, or whether or not I thought there'd be a diplomatic solution to the situation with regard to our hostages. That was the thrust of most of the questions that were asked. And me. what did you tell them? Well, I told them, number one, that I 
I thought that the uh, that there was an absolute need for their presence in the in the uh, in the Gulf of Oman and the uh, Arabian Sea, uh, not just for the hostages, which was very important, but also and if almost primarily because of uh, the Soviet incursion into Afghanistan and the show of force both to the Soviets uh, and to the Iranians and also to the Arab nations that we were prepared, capable, and willing to use physical force to defend what we viewed to be our vital interest. I also told them that I was not of the opinion that the use of force at this time by way of the use of military force was the best way to accommodate the release and the safe release of the 50 hostages. Well, now, Senator, you almost seem to be saying that you expect a force of this kind to remain out there indefinitely. Well, let me put it this way, Mr. Koppel. Even if the hostages are released tomorrow, I would not advise the President of the United States, were he to ask, to remove that force. I think it's absolutely essential that we have a major show of force in that area of the world because my concern is first and foremost for the safety of those hostages, but even beyond that, is for the protection of keeping the Straits of Hormuz open, being able to interdict any Soviet activity in the area, and having a significant airstrike capability to counter Soviet moves either in Afghanistan or south of Afghanistan and Baluch into Baluchistan or into Iran itself. In 16 years, it'll be the year 2000. He'll be 19 years old. What happens if every tax dollar that we pay 50 to 60 percent of us just going to pay the interest on the debt. He will be paying for what we lived on. Mm -hmm. We should be investing to allow him to be able to live on something. Joe Biden wants an immediate budget freeze, a constitutional amendment to limit spending, and a fair tax bill to guarantee our children's future. Delaware's own Joe Biden. This off-year election, in my view, may be the most important off-year election in modern history because we know what happens. We know the fundamental change that shifts if we lose the House and Senate. The only thing I'll have then is a veto pen. And I'd like to speak to our broader purpose here today, to remind everybody where we were a year ago, where we've gotten sense, the direction we're headed in. And all of you know that today is the anniversary, as Nancy, as Nancy said, since we passed the American Rescue Plan within the first month of an office. Thank God. Thank God you did it. And anybody thought well, we're going to pass a bill that's $1,900,000,000? Going to do that? Well, yeah, you did it. I ask you and you did it. Few pieces of legislation, no hyperbole, in American history have done more to lift this country out of a crisis than what you did. It took about 2 million Americans before I was uh, before I was sworn in, two million Americans have been vaccinated. Today, because of the efforts you what you voted for, we have more than 250 million Americans fully vaccinated. You all remember the lines of cars. Remember, nice-looking cars stretched for hours and hours to milk in just to get a box of food. Well, guess what? Stretching those miles and miles no longer is happening. That Outside a Denver Human Services office, staffers and volunteers with Food Bank of the Rockies set up a mobile pantry. A wide menu of food items is prepared to be distributed to people in need, some of whom are lined up in their cars already. In a typical week at this particular pantry, we could have anywhere from 75 to 100 uh, families coming through. We anticipate maybe some more because we're so close to the holidays. It promises to be a busy morning here. So we're going to need two people, one right there and one here for traffic. These boxes are essential for many. That box of food is not only in the table, uh, in the trunk. Because of that law, 41 million people put food on their table and are putting it on their table. Who wouldn't have been able to? Because of that law, we helped to keep a roof over 4 million people's heads who were about to be evicted. And we gave families what my dad used to call just a little bit of breathing room. Just a little bit of breathing room. Because we took action, we created, we created 6.7 million jobs last year, more than any other time in American history. And we hadn't stopped. Last month, we created over 678,000 jobs in February. You get us well over 7 million jobs. <laughs> Unemployment is down 3.8%.
The economy grew 5.7 percent, the best economic growth. growth in the last four decades. And the leading financial firm on Wall Street, Moody's, estimates that because of the rescue plan, four million more jobs are created, unemployment is 2 percent lower than it would have been, and had we failed to ask. We've got a long way to go, though. I'm not saying we're over. We're just getting going. And a lot of work to do. But never forget what we've accomplished together so far. And by the way, the American people just trying to stay above water don't understand this. You tell them what the American Recovery Act was, they look at you like, what are you talking about? Understandably. They're like my family. Mom, dad, four kids, grandpa living in the house in a three-bedroom suit level home. Just every single day figuring how you put enough food on the table, even when things are okay. Well, and on this one anniversary, the American Rescue Plan, let's be clear. We did it alone without one single solitary Republican vote. The simple fact is, this infrastructure bill is going to transform America. I mean, not figuratively, literally transform America. That's already starting. Instead of having infrastructure week, we have an infra infrastructure decade we voted for, okay? We got 4,000 projects all across the country, including 1,500 bridges in disrepair that are starting to be repaired this year. This year. There's so much we can do. Let me be clear. None of this is going to increase inflation. 17 Nobel laureates spontaneously a month and a half ago wrote to me. 17 Nobel laureates in the ec economic, in, in economics wrote me a long paper saying this will have — this will help ease inflationary pressures over time, not increase it, ease. And we can do this without raising one single penny on taxes on anybody making less than 400 grand a year. We're the only nation in the world. It's the reason why we're looked at as sometimes being arrogant. We think anything is possible. Anything is possible if we act together. Look. We've taken every crisis we ever faced and turned it into an opportunity. Think of one that hadn't had it that way. Whatever the crisis was, we've come out of it better than we were in before it occurred every single time. But we've got to stick together. We've got to stick together. We can do this again. We can do it. 